Hello, my name is Ed Chapman, and this slideshow is going to cover the characteristics of living things. For most of human history, people have put a lot of effort into drawing a line between what is alive and what is non-living. And there's a lot of vocabulary associated with this problem, and we're going to tackle that problem today in the slideshow. First of all, some words that you should associate with living are biotic, organic, and cellular. Biotic is pretty much a synonym for living. If something is biotic, we say that it's alive. Living things contain organic molecules, which are based on carbon. And as far as we know, all living things are built from cells. So these three words here are used frequently to, de to describe something that is alive. Whereas something that's non-living, frequently you'll see abiotic and inorganic and acellular. And I want you to see how the language works here. When you put a or in in front of a word, it turns it into the opposite. So let's get this list here and talk about all the characteristics that modern day biology uses to define whether or not something is alive. And as you can see up here at the top, here's the idea of cells. All living things are made from cells. They have at least one of them. Most of the living things you're familiar with are made up of millions or even trillions of cells all working together. The second thing I think is important is this idea of metabolism. All living things have a metabolic process that allows their cells to get energy and then use this energy to do something. And finally, all living things have DNA, a chemical that's used to pass on genetic traits from parents to offspring through time. Fire doesn't have anything like cells. Fire definitely doesn't contain DNA. And fire definitely doesn't have a metabolism in the same way that cells have a metabolism to get and use energy. The fire very well may reproduce, it may grow, it may develop into something larger, it may respond to changes in its environment. Uh, it definitely doesn't maintain an internal balance. There are fires that are much hotter than other fires, and fire is not part of a population of fire that changes over time. So, as you can see, some of the characteristics can go with non-living things, but all of these characteristics definitely go with things that we associate with life. Okay, cells. I'm going to put some pictures of cells up here for you to look at and what I want you to see is that there's no such thing as one single cell type or cell shape or cell size. Cells can be very small like these bacterial cells or cells can be very large like this this slice of a piece of wood which is tissue from a plant. So as you can see cells come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Uh, bacterial cells 10 to 100 times smaller than every other cell on this page. All right, all living things are organized, which means they're put together in a way that's not random. And organization is best studied using levels of organization. The first two levels here, the atomic level and the molecular level, are not alive. And this is the area that's frequently studied by scientists called chemists. You can be a chemist and study chemicals or a physicist and study atoms, and you're not really concerning yourself with things that are alive. It isn't until you get to the cellular level of organization that you've gotten complex enough to be considered alive. And everything from cells down and then back up and down here contain components that are alive. And as you move down this list towards biosphere, you're getting larger and more complex. So a scientist may choose to study life at the cellular level, the tissue level, the organ level, and as you move down this list, you're getting more and more complicated and you're pulling in more and more things until finally you arrive at the biosphere level of organization, which is the largest and most complex level in all of biology. All right, all living things reproduce, and in biology, there, is, there are only two ways really to reproduce. You can reproduce sexually or asexually. Asexual reproduction, very straightforward. You start with one cell and you go through a process that changes that one cell into two cells. And these two cells are genetically identical to the cell you started with. Another way of describing these two cells that you get are clones. They're clones of each other. So what made up the original cell has been divided between two new cells. So technically all the little parts of this cell here have been distributed between these two daughter cells. So nothing really has died or combined. What it's done is divided. Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, takes two cells, for example, an egg cell and a sperm cell, and puts them together to produce a single cell that is different at a very fundamental level from the two cells you started with. 
This produces diversity, which means populations that are reproducing sexually are producing individuals that are different from the individuals that were in the population earlier. Sexual reproduction has this advantage of producing genetic diversity. But in biology, there are only two ways to reproduce, to do it asexually or sexually. Finally, growth and development. All living things grow and develop. Uh, I'm going to put these two characteristics together because they're frequently talked about together. For example, in insects. These are the young of a dragonfly. They're called nymphs. They live underwater, and many of you probably have never seen dragonfly nymphs. These nymphs grow, they get larger, and they develop, they metamorphosize or go through metamorphosis to produce an adult flying creature that probably most of you are familiar with. This is a characteristic of all living things. All living things grow, and many living things, as they grow, they develop, like these insects. All living things respond to their environment in some way, which means if there's a stimulus, the stimulus causes a response. A good way of talking about this would be, again, with insects. Roaches are very sensitive to environmental stimuli, for example, light. You turn on a light in a dark room, and if there are roaches on the floor, they're going to run away. This is their response to the stimulus. All living things have a way of responding to stimuli in their environment. All living things maintain homeostasis. Now, homeostasis is a very important word in biology, but it simply means to maintain an internal balance. And I'm going to stress this idea of internal, which means there's something going on inside the cell or inside the organism that is kept different from the outside. And this difference is kept in balance. Easy way to see this is to think about body temperature. I think most of you are aware that humans are warm-blooded, and our body temperature, if you look at the Fahrenheit scale over here, is going to be somewhere right around there. And if you get hotter than that temperature, you're going to get sick. And if you get lower than that temperature, you're going to get sick. So we can say that humans maintain a homeostatic body temperature. It isn't just about body temperature, though. Humans also maintain a blood pressure, or a BP, you may have heard a doctor say. If your blood pressure gets too high, you're going to get very sick. If it gets too low, you're going to get sick. So we can say that humans maintain a homeostatic body temperature that's associated with their health. And finally, there's the idea of homeostatic water balance. Most of you know that a lot of the food that we eat contains salt, and that it's healthy to drink water. Okay? Now, why do we do this? Well... When you eat salt, you're making your body, your the liquids in your body, saltier. And if it gets too salty, that's going to cause a problem. You're getting out of balance. So you get thirsty and your body craves water. On the other hand, if you drink a lot of water, you're diluting the salts in your body and it's going to make your kidneys kick on and get rid of the extra water in the form of urine. So altogether, we can say that humans maintain a homeostasis that is based on temperature, blood pressure, salt and water balance, I mean, we could go on and on. But homeostasis is the characteristic of life where you maintain a balance on the inside that is different from the outside. That's a very important feature of life. All living things evolve as part of a population. And this is something that is very slow, and it happens over many generations. So it's difficult for one person to observe evolution happening. But all living things are part of populations, and they evolve. It's important to remember individuals, though, cannot evolve by themselves. In this graphic here, we can see this original ancestor species of bird traveling through time as we move up and staying the same, but the population is splitting into another species of bird, which looks very different. Now, if these two species, if these two birds can no longer interbreed, then we can say we have evolved a new species from an original species. And if the original continues, then we have two species. This process called speciation is an example of evolution. And in biology, all living things, from bacteria to plants to humans to trees, they evolve over time. That is definitely a characteristic of life. All living things have a genetic code that's based on a molecule called DNA, and DNA controls our heredity. That means that the part of you that you get to pass into the future is stored in a chemical called DNA. And that means that your DNA, which is human, is going to produce human offspring, like producing like. And it's these inherited instructions that make this possible. Now, the, pop, the 
process of copying DNA isn't perfect and sometimes you get random changes in the copying process or mutations that can produce evolutionary change over time. This graphic here is illustrating to you in a little bit more detail what's going on. Everybody inherits a set of genes that make up your genotype. You may have heard the word gene before and your genes code for your phenotype which is your appearance. So this little fly has a purple body and green eyes because it has its inherited genes in its chromosomes that control, control or code for this phenotype. So all living things, as far as we know, pass on genetic traits using a molecule called DNA. And this molecule controls our heredity. So let's review the list. All living things are made from cells. They're organized. They reproduce. They grow and develop. They respond to the world around them. They maintain some type of internal balance. They take in and use energy in a metabolic series of processes. They evolve as part of a population through time, and they pass on genetic code that's stored in a chemical called DNA. There we go. Hope, hope you understand the characteristics of life a little bit better.